like, you know, you might see that one fan that might travel to every show. So this kid had to have been to like maybe four or five in a row or something so crazy. <laughs> Jumps over the, the barricade. He's like fighting with security, trying to get on stage or whatever, right? The dude drops down on the ground, like acts like something happens. Bro, as soon as they let up on him, break off. They just start going crazy. that at least eight people are dead and hundreds others hurt during opening night of rapper Travis Scott's Astro World Astro World Astro World Fest last night mm. at NRG and no before last night seriously bro and like people were asking me oh is this going to be news is this going to be news and then like dude it's just still crazy how it happens i think about it every day man and i'm just trying to like turn it into a positive see how we can prevent this from ever happening again All right, so um, thank you for tuning in, John Cotter, Media Mayhem. Here, this is uh, this is going to be a, a special video, a special episode, a special interview um, because I have somebody I've been trying to talk to for a long time here, and I'm so glad that I finally have him here. Uh, Billy Nasser, he's a DJ, but he's a lot of other things as well, and you know I think that title of DJ doesn't exactly do him justice. But uh, Billy, tell me a little bit about yourself. How you doing? I'm good, brother. I just got back home from like a long like DJing work. Like I was gone for like two weeks. I'm back in Indiana right now. Awesome. Yeah, I saw that you were out for a while. Um, and you know, you have almost sixty thousand followers on your Instagram page. And my initial way of coming across you was being the guy that was jumping off stage at Travis Scott concerts. And I was like, that's cool. That's cool. And then you eventually sort of seemed to transition that into a DJ career, but can you kind of tell me about where this all started and about sort of your connections to those shows and getting on stage and stuff like that? Yeah, I can tell you the story about the first time I ever got on stage with Travis. Here. I mean, I've been DJing for over 10 years and like I used to DJ the spring break parties in Siesta Key down in Florida. So when the Astro World Tour was announced, I wanted to go down there and like see my friends and also see Travis. So I drove like 17 hours from Indy all the way down to Florida. The show got canceled the day that I got there, so I had to drive up to Atlanta the next day, bro. It was crazy. It was like 30 hours of driving, so I was like, if I'm going to do something like this, like I need to go crazy and like get on stage or like make it worth it, you know? So I always had this like dream of getting on stage, and like the first time I ever seen Travis was at the Birds Tour in 2017. I've been a fan since like 2013, but I really wanted to get on stage at that show, and I, I didn't end up doing it, so I made this plan to like try to get up on stage like the next tour. So when I got to Atlanta, bro, like my whole goal was just like jump the barricade and just hope that Travis saw me. And like, I got really lucky, bro. After I did it, everyone was trying to fucking do it. It was crazy. That's interesting the way you put it after you were doing everyone else was trying to do it. I think that's something that kind of encapsulates your sort of image on social media of somebody where it's like you look at this sort of these moments that you drop in of getting on stage and you know, eventually DJing it rolling loud, sort of this progression, but it's never as simple as that. And it's always a lot harder than it seems. Yeah, people only get to see like the tip of the iceberg. Like they don't get to see like everything that goes on behind the scenes. Yeah, like, yeah, continue on with like sort of how how that snowballed. I'm really curious about how, you know, you've been DJing and then the Travis Scott thing and how those two things sort of seem to go align for you. So... Yeah, I was in college during the Astro World Tour when I drove all the way down there. Like, my dad didn't even, had no idea. Like, I drove down there. I didn't tell him. And then uh, after that happened, that video kind of went viral and, like, shit was going crazy. And then two weeks later, I um, I went to the show in Detroit, which was closer to Indy. And I, I wore my dad's doctor scrubs. It's like a sicko mode joke or whatever. I just thought Travis would think it was funny or something. And I got up on this kid's shoulders and I saw Ray, his photographer, and I shouted, Ray! And I like put my hands out like that. And then he like snapped that photo. And like a week later, like I woke up to like my phone just like going off. Everyone's like, check Instagram, check Instagram. 
And then I just seen that post. I literally thought I was dreaming. I was like, this is crazy. And like, so the stage dive and that Instagram post happened within like two or three weeks of each other. So it was kind of like, that was like a life changing moment for me, honestly. When you saw that post, you said it, it felt like you were dreaming. And did you know at that point, like, I'm going to keep doing this? Oh yeah, I knew at that point, I basically was going to drop out of college and like try to go as many shows as possible. And just like, I don't even know, bro. I just figured that like, if I go to as many shows as possible, I can like network and like meet people. And then for like my DJ career, I could basically DJ in any city, you know, like go out and make friends all across the country. And that's basically how it's going now, bro. I can DJ anywhere in like any major city in the United States and have a place to stay and shit like that. So I got really lucky, honestly. Yeah, but you know, really lucky. But I think the bigger sort of picture here is like you saw you saw a chance. You saw almost like a void and like there's no one else doing this. And I have the skill set and, you know, the career aspirations to align with this. And it was almost like a perfect sort of mixture for you. Yeah, I saw the opportunity, bro. And like, I feel like a lot of kids that get the opportunity, like they would just die for the opportunity that I had, bro. And like all my family and even friends are even telling me, why are you going to so many shows? Like, why are you doing this? Like, and like everyone was trying to tell me not to do it. And now it's like working out. So s leading up from that point, you seem to get into connection with Rolling Loud and started DJing for an artist there, Cash Page, I believe. Right, right. Yeah, tell me a little bit about that and how your DJing experience and maybe some of the attention you were getting online potentially rolled up to a situation like that. So Rolling Loud was like the first festival I ever went to basically. And I I just remember being in the crowd with everybody and like imagining like, yo, well, I wonder what it'd be like to perform like at this festival. And uh, as I was building up my DJ career and everything, I think a lot of artists were like watching my Instagram and seeing like if they needed a DJ. And um, two artists reached out to me, Tyler Yahweh DM'd me, and then also Cash Page ended up DMing me like a year later. And uh, I was actually a big fan of Cash Page. Like, and it, you know, she did that song with uh, Don and Travis. But I had actually like listened to her in my car and like would ride around like listen to her. So it was crazy that she reached out to me. And uh, she was like, hey, let's do rehearsals. Like, let's, I thought she was joking at first, but like she actually wanted me to go out to LA, meet up with her, do rehearsals and plan for Rolling Loud because She's more of like an R&B artist, but she's transitioning into like the, more of like that rager, like upbeat, like hype, mosh pit shit. So that's why she was trying to bring me on. And uh, bro, that was like one of the best days of my life. Like that video of you jumping into the crowd insane, is, is, is crazy. I love that. <laughs> dude, I didn't even look. I was like, dude, I'm just going to jump. Cause like if I would have hesitated, I would have been like, nah, it's too high. Like I just like went for it, bro. Cause you know, you only get one opportunity sometimes. Yeah, for one real. One chance. And is, with your DJing career, is that something that you that you see yourself returning back to? Is that like for Miami or any of these upcoming festivals? For, oh, for Miami? Um, I'm not sure. I honestly like being in the crowd more. Like with what's going on with everything right now, I feel like with my platform, like I can help promote concert safety and I wanna like be in the crowd with everyone making sure everything's okay. Like I already did the big stages. If they want me to do it again, I will. I feel like I belong up there too, but uh, I'm not gonna like fight for it and like stress out if like I don't get to like perform another big festival again. But, like I, I wish I, I can one day. You know, I, I like what you said about how, you know, I belong in the crowd. Like you, you, you feel like you belong there. You've been in both spots. Yeah, that's where I started out, bro. Like I wouldn't have even been up there if I wasn't starting out in the crowd first. Like a lot of the artists that were performing like, I just try to give them the same energy that I would want from a crowd. So, like, all it takes is one person to get hype at a party or, like, a festival or whatever. Then everyone else just feeds off that energy. And, like, that's what I would try to bring. And a lot of the artists started no noticing, like, ASAP Rocky and uh, Sheck West and, like, Don and all them. Like, they really fuck with me because of that. And I feel like that helped me because, like, now that they're seeing me DJ on stage, it's like they're more familiar with me because they'd already seen me in the crowd. And it gives them a direct reason to take you seriously. It shows like you care about this part of the artistry and being with the crowd and caring for the crowd, but you're also like making a career out of it, making money off of it and making a living at the end of the day, doing what you love, but in your own unique way that I don't really see anybody out there doing right now. So I just want to applaud you for that. I think that's incredible. Oh, I appreciate you, man. It's really fun. I mean, I had to DJ for like 10 years for free before I actually started making like 
a wave. Like I started DJing around like 2010 or 2011, and I just started making money like a year or two ago. But I was just forming relationships with people and trying to like, you know, that's kind of rare nowadays, bro. That people will actually are so passionate about something that they'll do it without thinking about money. You know what I'm saying? But that's what helped me like start making money now. Like I make like up to 1k a show now. I'm doing like four or five shows a month. Yeah. You know, kind of transitioning a little bit toward what you were saying, you in that in that crowd sort of scenario and the race corrupted mind picture. I remember seeing that when when it happened before I was familiar with with who you were. And I think that that sort of image captured your aura and what you became to be known as really well. But the scrubs and the doctor mask and, and talk talk about that and sort of the semblance of that and where that came from. Right. I was just about to say, so my dad like always wanted me to be a doctor and like, so did my grandpa. They're both cardiologists. So like wearing it was kind of like a tribute to my grandpa and my dad, but also like they really did want me to be a doctor. So it started off as a joke, you know what I'm saying? Like even the mask, like I started wearing the mask because when I was DJing or like, uh, when people are like staring at me, it kind of like distracted me at first. So like wearing the mask just made me feel more comfortable, bro. And also like being at the festival when I would pass out masks to people, uh, that would let me know that they were with us. Like if I would see someone else wearing a mask, you know, I'm like, oh, like they're they're part of our group type shit. So like with what I'm doing now is I'm gonna be uh, shipping out scrubs, and giving people scrubs before the festival, so everyone can like recognize each other and we can all come together as a group. And like be organized at the show and make sure everyone gets water and make sure like you know nothing like the astro world event ever happens again yeah and you know kind of looking back at to where i first came into contact with you to reach out for an interview was the weekend before astro world the weekend before kind of all of that stuff happened and i just peeped that when you sent me the messages i seen it was november 2nd i saw that yep. and it, it really is crazy. Like it's it's pretty crazy. And you know, after the after it happened, I the way I found out was your Instagram stories. I saw it was like five minutes ago. You posted the messages saying talking about the dead bodies and just how destructive it was. And I was looking online. I was like, okay, this hasn't hit the news yet. The only thing I saw was local news. So I have my media mayhem platform, and I said. Okay, I'm gonna, you know, as a journalist, present this and be like, this is what's happening right now. We, these are the details we have. Your story in the local news. I wake up the next morning to 900,000 views and now it's at like 3 million, but it's, yeah, on TikTok. And it's crazy because you were V1, not only in my perspective and sort of my experience with it, but in the mainstream news perspective, you were talked to by People Magazine, CNN, Dr. Phil. Like, I was in shock where I was like, I was supposed to interview this kid. He's on Dr. Phil right now. Just I know, right? They wanted to, I had so many people trying to interview me. My, like, yeah, local and global, bro. Like, everyone. And I don't even like doing interviews, bro. So I was like really picky. But I felt like getting the message out there could maybe help this and prevent it from happening in the future. But also, bro, like, I was one of the only people at that festival i was in the middle of all of it bro like literally where everyone was passing away on the left side i was like in the middle of it and they were yelling like for a doctor for someone to help bro and i was trying to get out myself but dude I, it's fucked up bro like i literally saw people i've never seen death before and people were dying and dropping left and right like i was holding on to two kids trying to keep their heads up so people would stop stomping on their faces and I thought they were just asleep, and I, like, look into his eyes, bro. This kid's eyes rolled to the back of his head, and, like, they're not breathing. There's no pulse. There's a piles of bodies, people just piling up, bro. Like, and I remember leaving, like, 45 minutes before Drake even came out, and I was trying to tell the medics and everybody what was going on in there, and no one was taking me seriously, bro. And, like, people were asking me, oh, is this going to be news? Is this going to be news? And then, like, dude, it's just still crazy how it happens. I think about it every day, man, and I'm just trying to, like, turn it into a positive, see how we can prevent this from ever happening again. It's very real trauma that you went through in that moment and that so many others went through. And do you think that any concert or any sort of live event like this is sort of worth what happened at Astroworld? Because it seems that's what sort of like the public consciousness has gone is that the Astroworld story is seeming to leave the public subconscious. 
and how I yeah think. well people people in this generation bro don't really have like a long attention span and there's so much content being fired at us every day that we kind of this is kind of what you're talking about earlier that we don't really retain all the info i don't even think we're supposed to know all the information that we have like from our phones like we didn't evolve that way but dude like the way these concerts and festivals are there just needs to be more safety and precautions taken in and uh, it's really not worth it, bro. Like a nine-year-old kid passed away. Like it was just ridiculous, bro. And they market this shit to like younger kids, like through Fortnite and all this stuff. And honestly, I just don't appreciate the way Travis like handled it at first when he saw the ambulance in the crowd and saw people getting crowd surfed out unconsciously, and they didn't really pause it. Maybe for like ten seconds or fifteen seconds. There should have been like a ten-minute break or five-minute break at least to make sure everyone was okay. Like, I just didn't like the way they handled it. That's why I support, Tra I did support Travis as much as I possibly could, but like now after that festival, like it's really hard to keep like supporting Travis the same way I did. Even though I do, do love his art and his music and everything, and he saved my life and changed my life in a good way, like I can't continue to do the same things that I was doing, you know? I, I love and I deeply admire your ability to recognize and come to terms with that fact because i saw a lot of people calling you out for being like oh travis scott made you and all this sh all this shit. and i was really upset by that because i've been getting shit on bro like even yesterday i posted like some green hearts on a post about how they're doing the cactus jack heel uh thing i don't know if you saw that yeah i saw that and then i got kids commenting back at me saying that oh fuck off billy you over dramatized the show said hundreds of people died which is false info i said i thought it was over 100 because seven people died in just my area like i was figuring that it would probably be over 100 since there were hundreds injured and even other people said they thought it was over 100 but dude and then they're talking about how i talk shit about travis on dr phil i never once said anything bad about travis if anything i defended him they asked me about the apology video i said he loves his fans like he tried his best and i was just talking about how like what we would do at future concerts passing out water to people and shit but like people are always trying to twist the narrative and I feel like it's just coming from a lot of people who are jealous or like wanted to do the shit that I'm doing and they can't. So they just try to like shit on me. And like it's coming from a lot of like the Travis Scott fan pages, like kids who maybe only get like likes on a Travis picture. And that's like their closest thing that they get. You know what I'm saying? They don't even get to go to shows. or they, it, It's fucked up, bro. People who weren't at the show are talking the most shit. The craziest thing is I'm just a normal kid, bro. Like I start out in the crowd just like everyone else. But yeah, I DJ and like I'm doing really good in my career right now but like in my mindset bro i think that i'm just a fan just like everyone else bro and like i don't some people look up to me like i don't know bro i'm just trying to do better bro honestly and just like make everyone know that they can like do what i'm doing do you feel that you carry a heavy like burden of responsibility for crowd safety yeah bro yeah the fact that i i'm like one of the only ones at the platform and like I can actually make a change and there's people that like look up to me and want to like make a change, bro. So yeah, I do feel like I carry that. I feel like everything that's happened to me with the whole like rolling loud shit and like just being on stage with Travis and like being at the Astral shit, like happened to me for a reason so that I could like help concerts in the future. You, you seem to be putting together this sort of um, doctors and doctor scrubs and a brigade of, safety and well-being and taking care of the crowd and i saw you yesterday that you posted just a giant list of people that are on this list so just tell me a little bit about that yeah so it's a group of kids that go around to different festivals and concerts and we help pass out water um some of us are cpr trained and we're just there to like take the weight off of um some jobs that the regular medics could do like you know like we'll deal with like dehydration and stuff like that and they'll deal with the bigger stuff but basically, yeah, we just want to keep organized mosh pits and just look out for each other and just like promote safety. Just like wearing the scrubs, I feel like is just a good symbol of like looking out for each other. You know what I'm saying? I do, 100%. Like if you if you're in the crowd and you see someone wearing scrubs and like it's a group of people, you're like, oh, I'm in a good area. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like and that's just I'm trying to build that team that like promotes that and like. Uh, but yeah, the main thing is just keeping everyone hydrated and just looking out for each other. And sort of with what you said, like there's the medics and the people that are staff working there and part of their job is to keep the people safe, hydrated, all that. And now you're hopping into that space too because you see a void in there. With that all being said, and in, in specific reference to Astro World, what space does the artist have in responsibility for how their audience 
acts and their safety? I think that all artists that have like crazy crowds, like let's say like Little Uzi, Asep Rocky, Travis, Playboy Cardi, they should have teams that are in the crowd, like looking out for each other. Cause they, they have something like that, but th these guys aren't inside the mosh pits. They're like on the outskirts by the, you know what I'm talking about? Like by the railing. Mm -hmm. But we have eyes like inside the mosh pits that were people, stuff that people, other people can't see. So that, that's like the void that I'm feeling. Yeah. I, I specifically remember like at Lollapalooza, in 2021, I was at Cardi backstage and I was seeing people getting pulled out. You know, it's one thing to watch it on the live stream, which for the Astro World, a lot of people were, but it's one thing to be in there in the heat in the moment. And you, out of all people, have that experience and have that perspective of both. Travis did his Breakfast Club interview, post interview, but do you think that he's had been held accountable in a regard that? someone like yourself that was so close to the event considers appropriate? I don't know, man, being a celebrity and being like one of the most famous artists in the world, you're going to have like the weight of the world on you, no matter what you do. If he didn't do that interview or if he did that interview a little bit different, people are still going to talk shit. You know what I'm saying? But, um, there's just a lot of lawsuits going on, bro. Like, I don't know what's going to happen or how they're going to, it's still not been played out already, but I feel like he's, gonna do his job at helping out bro and trying to bring like a change because he's like the leader of it now like he has to like there's no other option and uh i think he's gonna try to turn this into a positive bro but he'll be forgiven eventually by everyone and drop his album and probably have another he's gonna have uh maybe get married with kylie or whatever and like have more babies and shit and people will forgive him but i don't know man I it yeah. I don't know if I answered that question the right way. No, yeah, you too. totally did. And well, that that's exactly what I was looking for is like what what is sort of your perspective on it. And I think uh, what the conclusion we've kind of both come to is no matter what, it's a happily ever after story for him because he yeah. is in that position. And I just, it's, it's incredibly complex and convoluted just to even think about of like there are so many moving parts of that whole situation but i think more than anything and i know you said like having people in the crowd but what can the artists their teams the festivals the people actually in organizations i was talking to the owner of rolling loud about this the other day i think it's called the voice of god or something they have something like this so where they hit it and like all the lights come on and then like a uh, the voice starts coming over telling people like what's going on and like they need to make sure that like the barricades aren't as congested as they were at Astroworld. Like the way they had the barricades at the most recent festival, I remember walking in like before the show even started and I was like, there's gonna be no mosh pits over here. Like we gotta go to the right side because there needs to be open space and there needs to be enough uh, exits. Like cause at Astroworld there was only one entrance and like no exits. That's how everyone got like boxed in. There needs to be like lower barricades so if people wanted to jump over and get out, they can. The barricades at Astro were like almost chest high and it was hard to pull people over. And like, there's a lot of stuff, bro, but just more security, more um, on staff medical personnel, just maybe like a drone in the crowd that like watches all the mosh pits and make sure like everyone's good. I don't even know, bro. There's so much more that can be done though. Cause it requires innovation and like that drone, like that's, that's a smart idea. I kind of like that. Um, but and I think another part of this, too, that I think also kind of goes into the the artist's responsibility is the culture of the artist and their music, because as we both know, as Travis Scott fans, the, the rage part of his shows has been part of his persona since the very, very beginning. And some have said that that has sort of been part of the reason that the show might have gotten out of hand, can add it on with people jumping in and jumping the fences with that going with security but um yeah like how, how do you think of that is involved with it and maybe people's reluctance to take the injury serious in the moment because it's a traffic yeah. honestly i feel like more people should stay sober during the show as a lot of kids think that they can go out and just get mad fucked up on like alcohol or whatever drug it is and they don't realize like how serious or how hot it gets in these mosh pits, bro. Like that's why I'd be staying sober because I have to be like focused on my surroundings. I might have like a beer or two or whatever, or, like smoke a little bit, but like we need to make sure kids aren't like doing hard shit, bro. Especially like since it's like 
been two years of lockdown. Everyone just wants to get outside and go crazy. So when I was when I was in there, bro, like I saw kids drop into the ground fainting and they were on the ground and other kids were just like dancing or like recording them or like, I don't know, bro. something's got to change, bro, because the value of human life at that show was like, no one gave a fuck. And people need to start giving a fuck, bro, or else this is going to happen again. Like, it was bound to happen, bro. Like, I don't know. People just need to start looking out for each other more. It's not just like, oh, rage, like, go crazy, go crazy. Like, we need to actually, like, have, like, organized mosh pits and, like, figure this shit out. Because there's a lot of people, it's like their first show, you know, they've never been to a show before. So we got to, like, set the tone for the future generations. Yeah, you have to assume, I think it's fair to assume that, that like, go in with the intention of this is everybody's first show if you want to keep everybody safe. Assume that they don't know what they're getting themselves into, because I feel like that is the case more often than not. After Astroworld, you, you, I can only assume, got inundated with interview requests, and you were, yeah. So t talk to me a little bit about that, because I specifically didn't want to reach out to you right after that, because I just felt like it would feel weird if, if I'm doing an interview with you during this very cataclysmic, traumatic moment. Everyone was hitting me up, but my DMs were basically flooded. Like, there were people from, like, Australia and Germany and Japan. And, like, I wanted to do interviews to get the word out and tell people what happened. Because, honestly, the news wasn't getting it right. They said, like, first they said, like, five people passed away. Then it was, like, nine. And then it was eight. Then it was 11. And it was 10. And, like, they kept changing the number. But, honestly, I think the real number was like much higher bro but i didn't even want to do the dr phil interview at first like i knew how people were going to perceive it and like try to twist it <clears throat> i told my best friend i didn't want to do it and he convinced me and it's not like they were paying me or anything like they, they pay for your flight and like your hotel but like besides that like you're just going and i remember like 30 seconds before i even went on to do the interview they were like trying to tell me what to wear with my scrubs and how i can wear it and how i can look on the stage with my mask and stuff and i was like we don't have to do the interview like we don't have to do it and uh, like 30 seconds before I even went on, I almost like canceled it. And then I just ended up going anyways. And I'm glad I did it, bro. But like at the same time, like I have kids who will never watch that interview or never hear what I said that will try to like make up shit and like pretend like I'm shitting on Travis. Like they were, they were dropping quotes about me and shit that I was saying before the episode even aired. Like they were making up fake quotes and shit like that. So it's just weird, bro. Like I gotta be careful about what interviews I do and what I say. I, I, I kind of the other aspect of this of that is do you feel like they used you for sort of their own purposes use you as a mean to their end i feel like some of them had a narrative like just to shit on travis like dr phil bro some of his like he asked me like three or four questions and like almost all of them were like a negative like shot at travis like they asked me about the apology video and I defended him on the, during that. And then they asked me about if I would ever go to another Travis show again. And they were asking me, uh, I said, yes, I would if I were to pass out water. It was with a group of people. And then uh, I'm trying to remember the other stuff they asked me. But yeah, they, there was like a narrative, especially with like CNN. I told them like everything that happened and what was going on. And then I said, I can't really support Travis as much as I used to. And they took that little line about me saying I can't support Travis anymore and just like used it as the headline. But that's like not really what it was about. But I guess they were just trying to smear him. But like, I see where everyone's coming from, bro. I honestly pray for Travis. Like, I hope he's gonna do good and turn this around. But I have mixed feelings about it, bro. Cause I don't think they handled that festival well. And it's just tough for me, bro. Like, I still listen to his music, bro. Like I, I was in the car today, just like listening to Mafia and Escape Plan. I think that shit's hard. Like, it's tough for me to like, and bro, after the first month of it happening, I didn't even listen to Travis because it would like kind of bring me flashbacks to the festival. It's kind of traumatizing, bro. But like, I don't think I'll ever like stop being a Travis fan like fully. Like, bro, this man like changed my life. What were you gonna say? I just think the pers the you have like a really mature perspective on just the after of all of this and retrospectively looking back at it and being able to sort of like pick things apart in this way and and talk about those experiences that you that you have and sort of how it's led you up to where you are now but it's not a straight edge to get there there's just so many jagged edges and experiences and i i, <laughs> I think you have one of the most interesting dj careers i've ever heard in my life so i think, there, I think there's that aspect to it as well uh, i appreciate you bro
You know, bro, when I dropped out, like my dad was so shitty at me. Like he like basically wanted to like disown me and not talk to me. Like it was really tough for me at first, bro. My dad still hasn't given me like a dime, like ever since I left. Like I had to do everything by myself. I still sleep outside, bro, when I have to, like when I go new places and shit, like like I had to sleep outside, bro. And like I really had to like grind for this shit. But people don't even see that. They just think, oh, he comes from a nice family, like he must be privileged type shit. <laughs> I don't know. That's it. No, that I think that automatically gives you the sort of like i was just saying the matured leveled perspective of you know this shit's real this is a career but also that also lets you i think dig into the more humanistic side of sides of it a lot easier yeah yeah some things just happen for a reason bro like i don't know like with the whole dj thing it's i think it's also weird that like i got on stage with travis and he posted me within the same two weeks and also that like this is kind of a weird coincidence that me and his DJ have the same birthday. We have the same birthday, May 11th. But um, I've just always tried to be transparent with people about what's going on. Like when you said from a mature aspect, like obviously I'm one of Travis's like, I don't know, people see me as like one of his biggest fans or whatever, but I'm not just going to like approve of everything he does. Like if the behavior's off or if something he does is wrong, like I'm going to like point that out, bro. Like I want people to like do better. And And I feel like right now we're in such an age where it's like, it's all or nothing with so many people. You either love and celebrate this celebrity or artist or you slander and hate them. And, and It's kind of like with the Kanye shit. There's like no in between. Like either you love and support everything he does or like it's like, oh, yeah, like, ah. there there's. And I think at, at the center of that is a, a fear of dialogue and a fear of actually getting into it with people that you might disagree with on some fundamental parts of that conversation. But granted, social media is not sort of meant for those conversations. It's meant for the snarky comments and things like that. Uh, it's all good. I'm just like continuing to do more shows. Like, bro, my goal is just like make the world a better place like every day. And I just try to spread happiness. Like my shit is like through art, like DJing, like getting people happy in a room, having everyone come together. I feel like that's really important in a world where like Everyone's trying to be so divided. Like the media is trying to divide us, like by race, religion, age, sex, like wherever we're from. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I feel like it's important to bring people together. That's like what the Mosh Pit Medic stuff is about. Um, I just want to have, like, even people who are going to a festival by themselves and, like, don't have a group to go with, like, they can come with us. And, like, the goal is to just, like, have more of a build this community up. And then uh, I don't know where it's going to go, but. It's kind of in the baby phase right now. I'm going to go get all the stuff embroidered and I'm going to like make the colors and like I want to make it dope for everybody.